Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. told of a certain African tribe learned an easy way to capture ducks in the river. Catching their very agile and skittish dinner would be a feat indeed, so they formulated a plan. The tribesmen learned to go upstream, place a pumpkin in the river, and then let it slowly float down into the flock of ducks. Now at first, the cautious fowl would quack and fly away. After all, it wasn't ordinary for pumpkins to float down the river. But the persistent tribesmen would subsequently float another pumpkin into the regathered ducks. Again, they would scatter, only to return after the strange sphere had passed. Again, the hungry hunters would float down another pumpkin. This time, the ducks would remain with a cautious eye on the pumpkin, and with each successive passing, the ducks would become more and more comfortable until they finally accepted the pumpkins as a normal part of their life. When the natives thought the pumpkins no longer bothered the ducks, they hollowed out the pumpkins, put them over their heads, and then walked into the river. <laughs> Meandering into the midst of the tolerant fowl, they pulled them down one at a time. Dinner, roast duck. Here's what I want us to get from that. If we aren't consistently guarding our hearts, it won't be long until we start tolerating pumpkins. Sins have a seductive way of sneaking into certain areas of our lives. They creep in one by one until we sink beneath them into a watery grave. Here's the thing. The Bible is full of happy endings. Noah and his family pass through the great waters of the flood, but they see a rainbow on the other side. Joseph gets sold into slavery, but rises to greatness and saves a nation from famine, and so on. The Bible is full of happy endings. The happiest story of all is, of course, in the gospel in which Jesus rises again after dying and then comes to us with a promise that our own story will have a happy ending also, which is eternal life through faith in him. Not every story, though, has a happy ending. Of all the sad words that we would read about Solomon up to this point, None are sadder than the ones that we come to right now. Look at verse 1 with me. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. The gifted British expositor Alexander McLaren writes, Scripture never covers the de defects of its heroes. Its portraits do not smooth out the wrinkles, but with absolute fidelity gives us all of their faults. Now this inspired biblical honesty is seen in the record of the life of King Solomon. God gave Solomon unusual wisdom, incredible wealth, and great opportunities. But in his older years, he turned away from the Lord and made foolish decisions and his life didn't end well. Proverbs 19.3 says, A man's own folly ruins his life. Solomon wrote those words and probably believed them. But sadly, he didn't heed them. King Solomon is about to do the trifecta here by disobeying God. It's almost like he had a list and was slowly checking off the things that he was forbidden to do. Don't multiply gold, check. Don't multiply horses, check. And finally, don't multiply wives, check and check, done and done. You feel like Solomon's life reflects a soap opera at this point. But instead of days of our lives, it's days of our wives. 
<laughs> so here's the tragedy. A story that begins in chapter 3, verse 3, that said Solomon loved God now ends with King Solomon loving many foreign women. How these, these book in text should sober us. Where are my affections? Has an imperceptible drift taking place in them over the years? Am I headed for tragedy myself because I have left my first love? These are the things I'm going to touch on this morning. Look at verse 1. It says Solomon loved. That's bad. Then it says many. That's terrible. <laughs> then it says foreign. And that's even worse. And finally it says women. I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> now, King Solomon loved many foreign women. The, the change of tone as we begin 1 Kings 11 is abrupt and ominous. The Hebrew emphasizes the royal office. It was the King Solomon who loved many foreign women. Now, this was a problem, but not for racist reasons. Psalm had previously prayed that the Lord would hear the prayers of the foreigner. Indeed, he prayed that all the people of the earth might know the Lord's name and fear him. Solomon's kingdom was remarkably positive towards foreigners, and this clearly was accorded with God's purposes. The problem was King Solomon's love for these many foreign women and the consequences that followed. The many women before us were now the Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite. In Hebrew, each of these categories are plural. That means there were many of each. Now, this is going to prepare us for the extraordinary numbers we're going to hear in verse 3 here in a couple weeks. Now, the Ammonites and the Moabites were descendants of Abraham's nephew, Lot. The Ammonites worshipped the hideous god Molech and sacrificed their infants on his altar. Chemos was the chief god of the Moabites, and Asterisk was the goddess of the people of Tyre and Sidon. As the goddess of fertility, her worship included legalized prostitution, both involving male and and female prostitutes, and that worship was unspeakably filthy. The Babylonians also worshipped the goddess and called her Ishtar. Now the people of Israel were not to intermarry with foreigners, because they were told by God that they will surely turn your hearts away from God. Now the strongest form of that command is found in Deuteronomy chapter 7, which reads, when the Lord your God brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, the Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, seven nations larger and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God has delivered them over to you and you have defeated them, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take their daughters for your sons. For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you. And he will quickly destroy you. And yet Solomon chose his wives from the very nations that God had prohibited. Now, probably to form alliances with local chiefs and clan leaders. And from a purely secular perspective, why not? If I'm a king, I have to figure that the ruler of the kingdom next door would be less likely to launch an attack against me if he knows that his own flesh and blood is residing in my palace. Now, he probably rationalized it as a means of national security but it was an act of rebellion and defiance against God. Good relations with his pagan neighbors became more important to Solomon than good relations with the Lord. <coughs> As an aside, this is why the Bible forbids a Christian to date or marry unbelievers. Even though some use the excuse they are dating this person to eventually 
lead them to Christ. It's called missionary dating. Now let me say that it almost always works the opposite way. Think about this. If you have a muddy stream and a pristine stream meet, the water doesn't become more clear. It becomes more muddy. And yet people will sometimes say something to the effect to me, you can't stop our love, man. <laughs> Whatever. I'll see you in counseling eventually. This is why we buy Kleenex in bulk from Sam's. But even Nehemiah remembered Solomon's bad example in Nehemiah 13 when he wrote these words. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them and pulled out their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, You should not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or your, for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by doing these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Now listen to this. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. Should we hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? Now granted, Solomon wasn't the first or the last man to allow some girl's batting eyelashes and swinging hips to turn him into a fool. But he may be the most surprising, considering that he himself warned against the dangers of sexual sins in his Proverbs. In the 5th, 6th, and 7th chapter of Proverbs, Solomon offers lengthy and descriptive warnings to men not to allow themselves to be sexually seduced. Further, he speaks of the value of having one single wife and of letting her be a blessing to him. Once again, Solomon knew the right thing to do, but he didn't do it. Now, of course, sadly, sexual immorality among God's people is nothing new. Samson was Hugh Hefner in a loincloth. <laughs> David's affair with Bathsheba stands out as one of the most uncomfortable stories in all the scripture. Now, Solomon is going to end up with far more wives than common sense. And things don't get much better in the New Testament. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he expressed shock at their sexual permissiveness, suggesting that they were even worse than the pagans. So what was Solomon's destructive defect? Ironically, at the first, he made all the right choices. When Solomon first rose to power, God gave him the choice of a lifetime. Whatever the king asked, God would give him. Wisely, Solomon chose wisdom. And as a result of that, God promised him a lifetime of blessing. But choosing for godliness is not the kind of choice that we make only once in life, and then everything else just falls into place automatically. This is something people usually misunderstand about Solomon. They assume that once he chose wisdom, his success was guaranteed from that point. And sadly, many people have that same misunderstanding about making a decision for Christ today. They assume that once they give their lives to Christ or pray the sinner's prayer, they do not ever need to choose for godliness ever again. But as Solomon said himself, every follower of God is called to keep following God. In Proverbs he wrote, My son, do not lose sight of these things. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, and they will be life for your soul and adornment for your neck. Then you will walk on your way securely, and your foot will not stumble. In reality, the choice for or against the kingdom of God comes to us every day, in every choice that we make. God made this clear to Solomon on multiple occasions. Immediately after granting his gift of wisdom, God said to Solomon, 
If you will walk in my ways, I will lengthen your days. So we see that long life and blessing was contingent upon faithful obedience. And yet Solomon was probably the only guy in the Bible who could give Samson a run for his money when it comes to embarrassing moments. But don't get the idea that they were two peas in a pod. Unlike Samson, Solomon didn't bench press camels to impress the ladies. Instead, his most distinguishing muscle was between his ears. He was so wise that people came from all over the world to pick his brain. If he were alive today, he'd be writing self-help bestsellers, taking questions from the audience on his own talk show, and giving motivational speeches to corporate conventions. And so it seems impossible that the valedictorian of the entire human race would ruin his life by making dumb choices. But he did. In fact, I believe Solomon's demise was far worse than Samson's because his gift of wisdom was far more advantageous to spirituality than Samson's gift of physical strength. Solomon himself affirmed this in Proverbs 24, 5 when he wrote, The wise are mightier than the strong. Simply put, Solomon was better equipped to see through Satan's deceptions than any man who has ever lived other than Jesus. But in the end, he became just as blind to them as everybody else. Look at verse 2. From the nations of which the Lord has said to the sons of Israel, you shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you. They will certainly turn your heart away to follow their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. The writer is clear that what King Solomon did had been forbidden by God for just one reason. He said, for surely they will turn your heart away from me. Now that was the problem. The words strike an abrupt and alarming note. They remind us of one of the most terrible episodes in Israel's history. In Numbers 25, Israelite men had sex with Moabite women. The women then invited the men to join them in their sacrifices to their pagan gods. Well, suffice it to say, it did not go well. So that loud crash you just heard was Solomon finally hitting rock bottom. Most scholars agree that of all the bad things that Solomon did, Nothing was worse than breaking the first and second commandment, which many people consider to just be one commandment. In case it's been a while, here they are. I'm the Lord your God who rescued you out of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other gods but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind of image of anything in the heavens or in the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. The sentence that chills me is that last one, where God, where God says he will not tolerate our affection for any other gods. It's the ambiguity that I find disconcerting. The fact that God doesn't say what he will do only that he won't tolerate our flirting with any other gods. Basically, he's saying to his people, if you violate this command, you are going to be sorry. And 12 chapters after these words are delivered, the Israelites are going to find out just how sorry. Now this, once again, is nothing new. Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai to meet with God and eventually came down carrying the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments. In the meantime, Aaron and the people were at the bottom waiting and waiting and waiting. We don't know, long, we don't know how long they expected Moses to be gone, but we know that he was gone longer than what they expected. If you've ever gone to the ER, you know that prolonged waiting can make you antsy. And antsy people have been known to do some crazy things. 
In this case, the antsy Israelites, with Aaron's approval, gathered up their gold jewelry, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When confronted by Moses, Aaron's explanation took the concept of a lame excuse to new heights. Aaron applied, don't get so upset, my Lord. You yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here out of the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and now popped this calf. <laughs> Aaron probably threw his hands up and said, crazy, right? Bro, no one was more surprised than I was. <laughs> now, imagine a teenager getting caught drinking one of his dad's beers. Aaron's excuse of Moses is comparable to the teenager telling his dad, all I did was open the refrigerator and this beer jumped right into my hand. Even the first kid who said the dog ate my homework thinks Aaron's excuse is pathetic. Well, needless to say, Moses wasn't amused. And more significantly, neither was God. Now the Apostle Paul references this for this reason. You see, because idols are inanimate objects, it's tempting to toss their significance aside with eye rolls and sarc sarcastic comments. But the Apostle Paul, for one, didn't do that. In 1 Corinthians 10, he was reminding his readers of the sins of the Israelites during those, during those wilderness years. He mentioned what he called pagan revelry, sexual immorality, and idolatry. Listen carefully to what he said. What am I trying to say? Am I saying that food offered to idols has some significance or that idols are real gods? No, not at all. I am saying that these sacrifices are offered to demons, not to God. And I don't want you to participate with demons. <coughs> that tells us that a biblical idol may be nothing more than a lifeless block of wood. But lifeless and harmless are two entirely different things. For instance... A pill is lifeless. But if you read the list of potential side effects that comes with some of those, you'll understand that they're not harmless. And likewise, an idol is just an inanimate object, but it's also a bridge to and from Satan's lair. It can open your mind up to evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Now notice where it says that he clung to these women in love. When I thought about that, it reminded me of the book of Ruth, where it says that Ruth clung to her mother-in-law. Think about that. At that time, Ruth was a pagan who clung to the Jew Naomi, but here Solomon, a Jewish king, is clinging to pagan women. Now, obviously, he cannot truly love these women in any meaningful sense of the word. When the Bible says that he clung to these women in love, frankly, it's sexual. This was a foolish sin of marital infidelity. Psalm was guilty of more than just sexual sin, though. The mention of princesses is a clear indication that many of these marriages represented political alliances. By marrying the daughters of foreign kings, Psalm was practicing politics, lusting after power, as well as sex. These women came from the very nations that God told the Israelites to drive out of the promised land. Yet Solomon foolishly joined forces with them through covenant matrimony. So as we finish up this morning, although he had never faced a significant enemy on the battlefield, he lost his biggest battle, and it was the one with himself. He inflicted permanent damage on his kingdom and left a legacy of suffering for those who came after him. He is living proof that a gifted mind is no substitute for an obedient heart. We can be vulnerable in exactly the same way that Solomon was. 
It is foolish and even arrogant to imagine that we are immune to the forces that cause his downfall. Solomon's story forces us to face some powerful temptations in our own lives. It's so very easy to go with the worldly seductive forces all around us today. But it takes courage to be different in a world that worships conformity. You may recall that Joseph was sold into slavery for being different. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for being different. John the Baptist was beheaded for being different. And most of all, Jesus was nailed to a cross for being different. This is a war we are engaged in. And by the way, there are no non-combatants in spiritual warfare. There is no spiritual Switzerland where we can set out the battle in neutrality. Not only do I not know of a better way, I don't know of another way, period, to avoid idolatrous decisions than simply to make God a part of everything that we do. Now Solomon eventually came to the same conclusion, for he said, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, do not depend upon your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. One commentator wrote, Somehow, somewhere, someone must make it emphatic that God is not an add-on to our lives. When he permeates every aspect of our lives, our plans, our hopes, dreams, careers, vacations, and those times of stress and strain, we will soon discover that he's not a meddlesome person to have around, but an indispensable and very welcome presence. So this morning, going forward, we have to understand that there's one throne in our heart. And it's not a love seat, a sofa, or a sectional. It's one chair offering room for only one person. And Jesus has said that that spot cannot be shared with anyone but him. We alone get to decide who or what sits in that space. So the only way to guard against seduction is to give that place to God and God alone. And Father, I pray that you would drive that truth into us this morning. For we do live in a very evil world. There's voices all around us all the time. And, you let, let, and yet you said, Lord, that if we turn to the right or the left, we will hear a voice behind us saying, this is the way, walk in it. Give us that heart, O oh Lord, that we would walk in your ways. For not only is your way the best way to live, it's the most productive. And I pray, Father, that this morning, anyone within the sound of my voice or who will watch this video that does not know you, that today would be the day they would come over from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Strengthen people here today, Lord, who are going through trials and temptations and troubles. Only you have the ability and power to do that, and you are well able to do it. We ask in your name, amen.